I'll repeat that because Jeremy does it of a mic. I actually have a mic, so when you have a question after each session, I will rush over and stick the mic for you to, uh, so that the people online in virtual land can also hear what's going on. Um, again, welcome everybody to this session. I I'm very excited to hear from our four panelists. Uh, it's part of the reasons why I chose to chair this session because I was actually very interested to hear their work that they're doing. Um, I, the first speaker, so I, we don't have that much time, so our first speaker is Diana Magnuson. Um, in support of the mission of I ISRA-D, <laughs> the Institute for Social Research and Data Innovations, I think, at the University of Michigan, it centers Diana, uh, centers is, Diana is responsible for managing the preservation of digital collections for IPUMS, MPC, and LCC. You can ask her what they all stand for. Uh, for research preparing procedural histories, documenting IPUMS USA, historical data, collection production, managing the physical collection of census and survey documentation for IPUMS, IPUMS education and outreach, managing the IPUMS bibliography and curating the, the ISRA D institutional archive. Diana will be presenting on stewarding our resources, building a sustainable IPUMS archival document access system. Diana? Thank you, it's a privilege to be here to present uh, on this, what I think is a really important topic. My outline for today is very simple and I just wanna situate myself in my institutional context, uh, present to you my problem and then share with you how together with a team we built an archival data access system and then some takeaways for you, I hope that will be useful to you. So, uh, sorry, I moved too far ahead, no. There we go, sorry. Uh, so this image visualizes the organizational structure of the Institute for Social Research and Data Innovation, and we call it ISRA-D. Uh, there are four centers, so there's the Minnesota Population Center, the Life Course Center, IPMS, and Minnesota Research Data Center. And uh, there are uh, uh, nine uh, data projects, uh, and some of them have sub-projects, so there are 12 uh, distinct projects at the University of Minnesota. And IPM's primary work is data harmonization, making census and survey data compatible across time and space. IPM's integration and documentation makes it easy to study change, conduct comparative research, merge information across data types, and analyze individuals within family and community contexts. Our data and services are available free of charge. And I'm at the University of Minnesota. I um, hope I made that. Uh, I added that to my slide there at the beginning. It wasn't clear. Uh, so IPMS International is one of uh, those 12 data uh, projects. It was begun in 1999. And IPMS International now contains over 1 billion person records spanning 103 countries and 547 census and surveys to date. And the focus of IPMS International is collecting and preserving data and documentation, harmonizing and disseminating data. As part of IPMS International uh, work, tens of thousands of supporting ancillary materials came from the United States Census Bureau, the United Nations Statistical Division, Latin American and Caribbean Demographic Center, the East-West Center, and CPED, and over 100 statistical agencies. Examples of this material include correspondence, maps, enumerator instructions, supervisor instructions, training materials, code books, publicity, reports, newspaper clippings, and so on. Uh, since 1999, a portion of the IPMS International grant money has been allocated to the preservation of these documents. Archival staff have been preserving thousands of unique and uh, fragile pieces of census and survey documentation, creating bibliographic records using an expanded Dublin Core profile that supports the use of controlled vocabularies to enhance findability for the project staff and for users. This slide visualizes the big picture of IPM's workflows. Uh, preservation and dissemination of our data products is already part of our workflow. And I put the archival workflows in blue. And last year I presented this slide when I did a presentation with uh, my co-author Wendy Thomas. We were talking about our work as an archive um, to uh, make an, create an application for the core trust seal. And so we created this uh, as part of that work. But last year when I shared this visualization, the document access system uh, was largely 
um, aspirational. Um, and this year, it's becoming a reality. So my focus in this presentation is our effort to build the data access system. The ancillary materials in our collection attest to the technical, business, social, and economic aspects of conducting censuses and surveys across the world, creating a sustainable, discoverable, and searchable access system for a broad range of archival census and survey materials will support the IPM's mission to democratize access to the world's social and economic data and support transformative scholarship. We believe curation and public availability of these materials will enrich the research of IPM's data users. This screenshot shows you the current IPM's document access system. It is static and limited to only international census forms and enumerator instructions. Um, users have to scroll to find documents uh, they are looking for with the minimal functionality of jumping to a region. So how can we better steward our ancillary resources and build a sustainable, discoverable, and searchable IPMS archival document access system? So building the IPMS document access system required a vision, uh, building the infrastructure, gauging the timing of our institutional priorities, and working with our IT product team. My predecessor, Wendy Thomas, whom many of you know, was a visionary. Uh, she retired last year uh, at the end of June. This is the two of us at iAssist uh, in Gothenburg last year. Um, beginning in 1999, as ancillary documents came to the archive because of the IPAMS International Data Harmonization work, Wendy anticipated the day an archival document access system would be a reality. She developed a process for creating structured bibliographic records using an expanded Dublin Core profile. Um, this work is primarily being done by undergraduate students. Uh, at one point, as we talked about this vision, Wendy uh, whiteboarded it uh, for me, and I thankfully thought to take a picture of it for the historical record. Um, archiving is not the central activity of ISRAD. Thus, we archivists needed to nurture buy-in from principal investigators, project managers, and institutional administration, or institute administration. In theory, PIs, PMs, and admins understand the importance and utility of an archive data access system, but their central concern is data acquisition, harmonization, and dissemination. Um, because of our effort at preparation, we were ready when an organizational opportunity presented itself. We operated on a when, not an if, approach. We were given an opening to submit a small project to the IPAMS IT product team. And I have a breakout slide on this because this aspect was so formative to me personally. Um, the process of working with the IT product team was highly collaborative. Um, some, there were several product team members and then one what I call a through line member, so someone who was there throughout the entire process. Um, they uh, asked four questions of us, and um, these were questions that really helped to, uh, to, to sharpen what it was that we wanted. They, the IT team calls this their product data sheet, the PDS. I had to learn a whole bunch of new acronyms uh, working with them. Um, so the first question, they wanted to know what was our objective statement, the project motivation, um, the project context, and the primary stakeholder. Um, we needed to identify major milestones and deadlines, what was the project scope. Then they returned to us what they called an MVP, their minimum viable product that they could produce in the amount of time that they had, um, and most important quality attributes of that product, and also a trade-off matrix. Um, then we discussed together the known business issues and risks and how success would be measured. We had dialogue um, to clarify project goals and develop a data workflow, and this was really, really uh, useful to me. There were periodic check-ins uh, across the months as they worked on this to track progress and to clarify action points. And then when they were in what they call their sprint, the last two weeks before the product was ready, we had daily check-ins. Um, so the workflow that they presented um, for, for this uh, tool that they were creating. This is their ideal product uh, workflow. And this too was very vis helpful to me. I didn't realize how important visuals are for me. Uh, but they sh uh, this is divided into two sides. So the researcher responsibility and the product team responsibility. They conceived of having three warehouses. So the first warehouse is where the student work goes. So when the students uh, are done and they, they say they're done, then it moves into a validation stage. When 
Wendy has created uh, to date seven Perl scripts that I use to run a validation on their data and to, and to clean it up. And then I move it into warehouse two, and that is where the product team, the IT people take over and they move it into uh, their database. And then in warehouse three, they work their magic with their tool and, and then they push it out um, to the web app and to, to, our, to our users. Uh, so this was very, very helpful. So the next series of slides that I have are just some screen captures of the product as it was in development. So this is the first, um, this is a proof of context, uh, concept, sorry, proof of concept that was presented to me. So it's an early mock-up. And um, th at this point, we are now calling it our IPAMS document collection. So the um, IPAMS archival document access system, kind of a cumbersome term, but that, that was our working title. And actually to come to this uh, IPAMS document collection was a lot of discussion um, amongst uh, a, a variety of stakeholders, but we're calling it our IPAMS document collection. So this was the initial proof of concept and uh, and it, you know, it's very basic, but it shows us that MVP, that minimum viable product that we wanted to have. Uh, this is um, some screenshots of the wireframes from the web developers, so you can see uh, that I had to come up with some text around what is this, where did I want um, the language to go, our email address, things like that uh, are there, and then our controlled vocabularies. When they ask the question, do you want to have a drop-down menu? It's like, of course I want a drop-down menu. So uh, they, have, they created them for the countries that we have uh, represented in the collection, as well as the um, controlled vocabulary, so there are 22 items that the students use when they're creating their bibliographic record. So this makes the search um, very, very useful. And then our landing page, what it looks like when your results come up. And now um, the world premiere of the IPAMS document collection. So I'm happy to present this to you. Yes, thank you, thank you. And I am not joking, this is the world premiere of it. And uh, so this is what it looks like. And it was so exciting to see the branding there, the favicon, I didn't, I learned that term. Um, so the little tab thing at the top, um, but what the language looks like and um, uh, what, what the search tool is going to be. So um, these are just screenshots of um, a search, what it can look like, and you can select multiple countries. You can select a range of dates. Um, and you can select the document types that you're looking for. And when you do your search, and I did uh, a search here, and this is Australia, 1926 to 1921 was my, my date range, and then I selected all types, and I got, I think it's like 723 results of documents that are in our database. And when you click on the first result, or when I clicked on the first result of a full document, what you see on the right is what comes up, so a PDF of the document. So a lot of the work that the students do, it, not only creating the bibliographic record, but they have to scan documents, they have to clean them, um, and we, because we want them to be as, as legible as, as possible. So this is free to the users. This is the IPAMS way, um, democratizing access to this data. It's free, and you can download it. Um, so what are some takeaways uh, for, uh, for you? I hope these can be useful to you. Um, so where is your archive or the work that you do a side project of your organization? Maybe that's the situation in which you find yourself. Uh, identify what you are a side project of and where you touch the main product and how the archive will enhance that main product. Uh, know the priorities of your organization. Um, we, um, excuse me, always frame within what you want to do within the context of what the organization is there to do. Uh, IPAMS creates large harmonized data sets and provides free access. So we planned our supply creation in terms of how it would best be put out to end users and we worked on building infrastructure as well as a delivery system. Uh, leverage work with the IT staff, um, develop long and short-term goals. This was not an anticipated benefit that I had with working with the IT staff, but they helped me to develop things that can be done in the short term and things that are aspirational um, that we're gonna do in the long term. It also helped me to identify strengths and weaknesses of archival data management uh, and how I was proceeding, so that was very helpful. And then um, an unanticipated benefit is I got to educate the IT staff on 
on the role of the archive within our organization, with which sadly they were not quite aware of, of what we were doing and what we were hoping to accomplish. But through our conversation, through the work on this application, they are seeing ways that they can, they can um, build it out uh, to other areas of our organization. Take the long view. This is where Wendy Thomas was so instructive to me. So she modeled this so beautifully. Um, uh, she, in her tenure, did not get to see this happen, but she prepared the way for it. Um, she focused on the use of a controlled vocabulary in a simple search system. Um, she said, we're going to start out small and we're going to scale up. And to that point, what is in our um, document collection right now is just one region in the world. It's Oceania. And uh, the student, uh, imminently, Africa will be added because that data is, is cleaned and just about ready. So that will be going in. My students are finishing up. Uh, with Asia, the region of Asia, so that will be cleaned um, by me and you know moved into warehouse two and then three, and then they will be getting their work around the region of Europe. So we started out small, but we can scale up. Uh, uh, build a flexible infrastructure that allows, uh, allows the archive to take advantage of organizational opportunities. So when that opportunity presented itself, we said, can we do part of this? You know, we have this bigger vision, but we were ready with something that could immediately be taken by the IT team to build, to build their tool. And then um, lastly, never waver from the position that preservation, discoverability, and dissemination of archival material is valuable to the main product. For us, expanding and deepening this search and delivery system will provide findability and accessibility to a rich set of supporting archival documentation that will illuminate census development and implementation processes around the world. For example, access to materials documenting the development of enumeration forms and procedures over time supports researchers' understanding of how statistical entities responded to the challenges of collecting demographic data on difficult to enumeration populations. So thank you for listening today. Thank you, Diana. Um, I cannot, uh, I cannot let people know that, or uh, ask people to check IPUMS out if you haven't in the past. It's it's just such a resource, and it's used by so many people. Um, are there any questions? Hi. Thank you for your presentation. I have two questions. Um, how long, <laughs> question number one is um, like how, I guess for how long had you identified the need for this product before it was implemented? Mm -hmm. And then um, have you thought about like, um, like the, the lifetime of the product and if like, I guess how long do you expect it to be like alive so to speak? Um, and like, is there an end of life plan? Okay, so th to the first question, Wendy, when the IPMS International Project was started in 1999 and these documents started to come in for the harmonization work that IPMS does, that she at that moment said we need to have something to make these these materials available. It was like we were sitting on top of this treasure trove um, that people did not have access to. So as, as far back as 1999, um, it, it's really about institutional priorities, and uh, IPMS uh, started in 1993, and um, it was always about, you know, the microdata and then the aggregate census data, or excuse me, um, yeah, ag uh, aggregate, sorry, geographic data, uh, and then survey data. So it's, it's about that data harmonization and um, documentation and, and getting those things out to users. So the priority for the archive just never quite bubbled up to the top, but Wendy had a resolve and she never wavered that this was important, and as Wendy would say, you know, I, I, I bought into that. I'm an historian, when I came to the work, it seemed 
unethical to me that we have these materials and we are not sharing them with the world. And um, we are at a moment in our institutional history where there is demand for this now, um, and it's being written into the, into grants. Uh, it was it was written into the IPMS International Grant that they needed to preserve this, but institution wide, this is becoming you know is is more recognized that we need to do this. And it seemed like an opportunity with the tr the handoff from Wendy to me that I would take this on. She had a lot of other very important responsibilities at the institute, um, but with a new person coming in, you can build it into your into your um, into your workload. As to the lifespan of this, I hope it's eternal. Uh, that that is my my desire. But um, it, our administration uh, project uh, uh, people are looking at okay, how how busy is this going to be? How much traffic will it get? You know, will it die on the vine? Is what someone said to me, and I said, not on my watch. I'm going to go to every conference that I can and share the news of this. There will be things written about it, um, public publicity around it, when it is formally presented to the world. So you guys get the first look at it, um, but uh, when it's formally presented. So those are two great questions. Thank you. Another question? Yeah. Uh, hi, Dan. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Jiebei from NYU. Uh, I just want to say something about IPUMS um, as a long-time user. Uh, I just want to say this is the, uh, for me, this is the best census sources when I need to look for resources. It's not actually Census Bureau, but your uh, places. If I couldn't find the data set on your site, I will go to Census Bureau. So mm -hmm. I just want to mm -hmm. say thank you for providing such a usable platform. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for, for folks, if you haven't used an, uh, IPUMS, I would definitely recommend this because it's so accessible and it's so searchable on both years and level and also variable level. Um, so for my question, I don't actually have any question, but maybe I'm just curious about do you have any uh, major development like adding new study or data in uh, IPUMS in future? Uh, well, a new data set that was just launched is uh, Cultural Determinants of Health. So that was just launched a couple of weeks ago. So that's that's a brand brand new one. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, I'm gonna cut it right now. But uh, as I was gonna say, I'm gonna encourage everybody to seek our speakers out afterwards, or email them if you have follow-up questions. I have a bunch, but I'm being very um, magnanimous by not asking my questions. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Okay, shifting gears, our next speaker is going to be actually presenting online, I believe, from the Netherlands. So I'm not quite sure what time it is there, but uh, I'm glad she's being able, being able to con uh, connect in. Our next speaker is Angelica Maineri. Uh, Angelica is data manager at the Open Data Infrastructure for Social Science and Economic Innovation, which I'm going to pronounce as Odyssey or Odyssey, but Angelica can correct me when she gives her talk. Uh, where she is part of the coordination team and the project lead of the FAIR Expertise Hub for the Dutch Social Sciences. Angelica holds a PhD in sociology on the perception of risks arising from datafication and has gained experience in RDM while working in the central team of the European Value City, a large cross-national survey program. Angelica's presentation is entitled The Odyssey Portal, building a metadata repository for the social sciences in the Netherlands. Angelica, take it away. We cannot hear you, Angelica, but I'm sure people are struggling in the background trying to get this to work, the audio to connect.
maybe, I don't know if this is something that the tech people can work with Angelica on the side and we might just go to the next speaker for that. Oh, <laughs> that's a good sign. Can we hear you, Angelica? No, okay. Okay, I think I'm gonna take uh, the chair's prerogative and I think we'll move to the next speaker for now. Uh, and then hopefully we can resolve the technical audio issues so that Hanak and Hanaka can join us again. So uh, our, our third but now second presentation is uh, by uh, Jingguan Yang. Uh, Jingguan is the International Government Information and Public Policy Librarian at the University of Michigan Library here in the United States. Before she became a librarian, she earned a master's degree from the University of Michigan School of Information. She also got her master's degree in political science from the University of Pittsburgh and the Iwa yeah. Women's University. Boy, I'm learning how to speak other languages today in Korea, concentrating on international political economy and East Asian politics. Uh, Jing Wang will present the work by her and her collaborators at Seoul National University on their research on the long-term development plan of the Korea Social Science Data Archive, KASDA. Thank you, Lon. So I am have a habit to working around, walking around while I'm presentation, but I supposed to be sit, stand here, right? Okay, <laughs> I'll keep in mind. Okay, thank you for inviting the IRCS 2023 presentation. So I'm working at the University of Michigan, but I'm talking about the uh, COSTAS, you know, the long-term uh, development pr project, which I work with uh, those professors of SNU, so, uh, Seoul National University. So probably people do not know much about the COSTA. The COSTA is an abbreviation term of Korean Social Science Data Archive. Uh, it was a very long, very prestigious, traditional social science data archive. It is established in 1983. So in the Korean social science researcher, usually we think that this is the Korea's IHPSR. So that way you probably understand. So there's a history. So it was started in 1933. It was actually part of the non-profit organizations, you know, the, you know, the organization, but it was uh, observed to the 2015 to the Seoul National University because they cannot sustain the, those, you know, the this organization. And at that time, when they come to the uh, Seoul National University, it was part of the uh, SNU Asia Center, as you know, part of them, because they do not know where they're located. And then they have produced good, you know, the work over time. So uh, 2022, they upgrade uh, this COSTA as independent research center. It became a part of the College of Social Science, you know. So there's a change. So what is the purpose of research? The first thing is their status was, has been changed. So it became an independent research center. And second one is the budget has been increased. So they can do some more, you know, <laughs> in the end. And then, so they need to find out the kind of long-term project for the reorganized COSTA. So there's a five investigators, you know, invited for this project. So was my you know, colleague. The first one is uh, uh, Professor Won Park, Park, who is the director of the COSTA actually, and a professor of political science of SNU. A second person is uh, Sako Kim. Professor Sako Kim is a professor of sociology and also the assistant director of the planning and research department of COSTA, and me, and there's a two research assistant, you know, uh, Doan and Hyoan. They're graduate students of political science and sociology uh, at SNU. So project term is starting from the last, you know, the year, the, from March to the October, eight months. We have a weekly meeting. In my case, I stay in the U.S., so we have, I have to stay the, until the 1 a.m. every Tuesday. And then we also have an interview with the stakeholders, uh, such as the COSTA staffs and COSTA education program participants, because just like the ICPS or summer program, COSTA also have that kind of status, you know, the end research management not the research management, statistics, car, you know, the education program. And we also have a interview with the data donors. And we delivered the white paper to the SNU administrative office and COSTA people in last November. 
So what we covered in the white paper, uh, like this. The first one is the government's research data management policies uh, of Korea, US, and uh, European unions. And also we produced the uh, Korea uh, cost of website usage per, uh, pattern analysis and donated data usage analysis and education program review and one-on-one -on -one in depth interview with the data donors. So there's a lot. <laughs> And today I'm going to only talking about the one-on-one -on -one, uh, in-depth interview result with the data donors uh, because I only have a 15 minutes and that was, in my point of view, that was very interesting. So first, before we set up the interview, we gathering a lot of you know, the data and kind of users, access, uh, donors information and policy studies. So this is my initial, our initial findings. First thing is, a significant number of donated data set comes from the Korean government agencies or research centers related with the government project. Because there's a lot of, uh, they have a cost consortium. There's a lot of uh, academic universities, research center is the, also the member of this you know, the project. We thought that there will be majority, but actually the government agency's research data was a lot, and it was used a lot. And also, but interestingly, Korean government currently has no official regulation related with research data management. Actually, never they have a regulation about the RDM. So that was very interesting why they donated this data to the COSTA. And we also find out that some institutions, including the government agencies and academic research centers, they have their own website sometimes. They have contact information. So researchers actually can get their data from their website, but they still donating the, their panel data series in the COSTA. So that was very interesting for us. So what we did is we recruited eight participants from the, those you know, the donors. And those eight participants is from the head of planning department, which is government agencies, and director of the research center, professor and government document librarians. So they are really core person who know, understand what, the, what kind of data they have. But the, some of them is only dealing with the two or three years. Some of them is more than 10 years. They are dealing with those, you know, the connection with the COSTA. And their organization is Center Government Policy Institute and research centers related with the center government or local government. And universities, academic research center and NGOs. So very diverse. And then each, data set have a very distinctive you know, the topic. So some of them is dealing with the gender and family, some of them is education, some of them is law and regulation, welfare, human rights, Congress, general public affairs, and social values. So we can see that there's no bias. There's a kind of overall you know, the, you know, the issue they cover. We only have uh, three interview questions. The first is uh, what is the incentive uh, data donation or preservation? And second one is uh, how to evaluate the COSTA's data preservation process. And third one is just the future needs. So what we did is it was pandemic you know, period, so we cannot meet in person. So there's a Zoom, it was a 60 to 90, you know, the minutes one-on-one -on -one conversation. So we just throw the general question and we just talk and it was recorded and then one of the, our researchers uh, assistant pull out the whole script and reviewed everything and then every each you know the interview we do the debriefing session so that's how we gathering this information so first of all what our findings of incentive of data donation first thing is a very strong ethics about the data uh, especially the government organizations, you know, the participants think that data is public good. So they mentioned that they do not know each other. They just talk same thing. We are very surprised. The so data generated by the government organization is property of a Korean citizen. Sometimes they say people had the right to know about what we did with the tax money. So that is a strong incentive from the government agency. All of them talk about that is uh, they have experience of lost their data in the past. That is their strong belief that we need to keep this data in the safe place, everybody, including the organi uh, government organization and academic institution and NGOs. And third reason is they do not have money or you know, they cannot hire the data curator by themselves. So that's why you know, they think the COSTA have data curators, they have uh, how to preserve the data. So that's why they want to uh, donate it. 
And another thing very interesting is they sometimes have a series of panel data. Once they, uh, you know, the preserve the one data, they, what they found out is sometimes it's only social, uh, sociology data, but sometimes education people, social works people, political science people suddenly contact them, you know, can I get the next round of data? So they found out that this is a cost study effect because they only have a very small, uh, you know, the audience, but they found out that they exit, their data can be exposed to the variety of researchers. So they decide to preserve those data as well. And in case of data preservation process, it was so strongly positive. We were kind of worried about that. And what we found out is, I think the Costa staff is very polite. When we interview with them, they never talk about that, how they do the extra activity, but actually they did work a lot. The first thing is some of the organization was just newly organized and they do not know how to do it, then they contact the COSTAS staffs and they actually provide a consultation service, even though there is not uh, their responsibility. And another thing, very surprising thing is the COSTAS staff sometimes email them when they learn that next round data is released, they email them, it's the time to you, you know, donate the next round, <laughs> you know. That is not their responsibility, but they did that. So we learn from the donors. But also the third one is kind of depressing one is they actually those, you know, the donors have their own job responsibility. This is you know, take care, uh, connecting with the Costa is kind of extra work. So there's no reward system for the donor institution's officer in charge. So that was also quite a problem. So what they need for the, uh, from the COSTA is like this. First one is, as we said this, you know, the conversation, they need a desperate guideline and standards and regulation for the qualitative data collection management and nobody know about it. Yeah, that was, you know, problem. Second one is, as I mentioned before, there is no uh, data curator in their institution, so they ask them, can we, can you, the COSTA develop the education program for the data management service officers? There's a, their second strong, you know, the demands. And also the, they want to find out kind of easy access to usage statistics. It turns out the COSTA, you know, the officers kind of send the newsletter, you know, monthly, how much your data has been used, something like that. But in, it, if you are familiar with ICPSR, when you go to the, uh, the data set, you can instantly see the, how much you use this data in monthly, yearly, something like that. So they want to like that kind of online, you know, the automatic uh, access to usage statistics. And finally, they really want more academic collaboration between the, their organization and the COSTA because not only just deposing the data, they want to have these things. So, so what we found is very, very strong trust to the COSTA. Thankfully. But there is a challenge. The first thing is, as I mentioned before, the COSTA staff and the donor institutions officer, both of them is work overload is so significant because this is really, I do not know how much they, I do not understand how they handle everything, you know, in their working hours. So probably they work more than 60 or 80 hours per week. That's my assumption. Second one is, while we studying that, already director of the COSTA, Professor Park, opened the data curator position because he think that urgently we need some more people. But we can, uh, they cannot find the right person because what we knew, what we learned that is scrub information does not teach the data curation class, you know, right now in Korea. Only handful of one or two, you know, university professor very interesting in it and they're in the local area, not in the Seoul area. So it's really hard to find a good data curation and preservation expert in Korea. And the third one is management of sensitive data. There was not trained, trained at all. So I found a very doom one, but there's a couple of hopes. So first one is, of course, the second open social science data forum was uh, held in a couple of months ago. And this time, the COSTA invited the donor, <laughs> data donor from the government organization and research you know, the center of the university. And they have shared for the first time how they collect the data, how to distribute data, what is the problem. That was so, if you know about the Korea, Korean language, I wish 
you listen to those things. They are so enthusiastic. Even though the presenters cut it out their talk, they are really eager to talk about <laughs> their <laughs> research data management and the data creation. That was so hilarious, and I feel so happy for that. The second one is, I mentioned about Doan and Hoan was working very hard to, for this project. And there are actually the graduate students of uh, political science and sociology. But after this project, they decided to change their path. So Doan will going to be the PhD program of University of Maryland uh, data science program this fall. And Hoan will be the PhD, and will study the University of Arizona's PhD program for the research data management. So we have some small hope. I really want to. <laughs> uh, they study very hard and contribute for the development of the Costa and the Korea Social Science Data Archive. Thank you. Thank you, Jung Wong. Are there any questions? Hi, thank you so much for this talk. Um, my name's Sarah, and I was I was wondering, you mentioned some possible reward systems mm -hmm. for the data management officers, and I was wondering if you could say what some of those might be. What are some rewards that would be really valuable to them? Uh, so, that is a good question. In case of COSTA steps, I can understand, because a COSTA step, actually, they're everybody is a PhD, you know, the earned in the, the researchers. So they're, half of them, they do their work, and then half of them, they have to work the COSTA. So there's so much, you know, the working hard, but nobody kind of understand what is the, you know, data, you know, the curation or data, you know, the management. So there is no reward system, any raising the salary or something, you know, or they change their kind of status, that is quite difficult. In case of the donors, you know, the part is the same. They are government officer who delivered the development in you know, the project or they are in you know, the researcher who in the government organization. So if they can get the real kind of uh, real da data you know, the manager, project manager, or if they can be the project managers, they can have a strong kind of official position, they can be the reward, yeah, or salary <laughs> increase. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Oh. Hi, I am Jennifer, I'm with ICPSR. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for your talk, mm -hmm. It's your work is really interesting. Um, I have lots of questions, but the main one is, how did you determine what questions to ask in the one-on-one -on -one interviews. Ah, so that is a, hmm. so what happened is the initial you know, finding situation quite important. I mean, I kind of trained as a political scientist before I became a, you know, the librarian. So that's what I learned, you know, initial, you know, standing, uh, initial, you know, the research, we kind of find out that these three questions is a very key moment for the ICPSR because we do not know when, when we found out that they have their own kind of service, but still they, you know, the donating the data, we really want to know what is the intention, what's the future of the Costa, what they need, you know, something like that. So that is a, we prepare those three questions after our group, you know, the meeting. And as a social scientist, I think that there is a kind of detailed question is for the survey question, actually. And that, that kind of very broad question actually very good they can speak many things. I did not include so many, I kind of dropped out so many detailed information, but we can learn a lot from them. So usually when we do the, some kind of interview, we tell them, don't speak, you, you, you know, ready to listen what they talk and don't kind of cut it out. So that is a kind of, that's actually my strategy. And I, th I think this time is very working very good because everybody have a very good positive attitude toward the COSTA, so they provide a lot of information. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I'm, it's really exciting to hear about your research, but it really puts COSTA on the map. I, mm -hmm. I confess that I wasn't aware of it, and I did a quick search, and you have over 3,200 data sets Yes. in CASDA, and yeah. so that's something you always learn when you come to IS is it's like, here's another source of data that I can refer all of our researchers to that I didn't even know existed. 
So I think the work you, you are doing in terms of really helping to enhance and also let other people know about CASA, I think is really valuable. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks to our crack AV staff. <laughs> Italica is ready to go. Um, I read this before, but I think you probably forgot what I said, so I'm gonna read it again so you, you can really know Italica, her background and everything. She, she's the data manager at the Open Data Infrastructure for Social Science and Economic Innovation Odyssey Consortium, where she is part of the coordination team and the project lead of the FAIR Expertise Hub for the Dutch Social Sciences. Angelica holds PhD in sociology on the perception of risks arising from datafication and has gained experience in RDM, research data management, while working in the central team of the European Value Study, a large cross-national survey program uh, her presentation, as you can read, is the Odyssey Porto, Building a Metadata Repository for the Social Sciences in the Netherlands. Angelica, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me now. Can somebody confirm? I'm in the chat. It really should work now. I tested it. Yes, okay, great. Okay, apologies for the problems before. Okay, thank you. Thank you and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to present today. I'm really sorry I cannot be there in person. Uh, I'm presenting from Amsterdam, it's a bit rainy. I hope it's a bit better there. Um, so uh, indeed, I'm, I'm going to present you the Odyssey portal and I have to say, I think this is the first time I present it to such an international audience. So I hope I... <laughs> Uh, removed all the references to the Dutch context, but if something is in there, um, I hope there is time at the end for clarifications. So today I'm going to briefly uh, introduce you to the Odyssey, the Open Data Infrastructure for Social Science and Economic Innovations, and then I'm going to uh, dive deeper into the Odyssey portal. All right, so... Um, Odyssey is a consortium of more than 45 member organizations, which include all uh, social science and economic faculties, or most of them in, uh, from universities in the Netherlands, but also e-science e-service providers such as um, CBS, so Statistics Netherlands, uh, but also DANS, the National Data Archive, and a number of other institutes. Um, we are a consortium, and what we are trying to do is really to build a federated data infrastructure. So we don't want to build something completely new from scratch, but we want to make sure that all the partners work together to deliver the data, tools, and skills that are necessary for embracing the computational turn in the social sciences. We have a membership structure, so that means we have some membership fees and some core budget, but we also try to get uh, funding for more specific projects. And uh, what I'm presenting today, the Odyssey portal is part of a, a roadmap project which was funded by the Dutch Research Council in 2020. Um, I'm here representing a big team, um, the, the, and I want to acknowledge their, their role uh, really because there's a lot of technical people working on the Odyssey portal from the Dutch uh, National Archive or DANS, uh, from the Computer Science Department at the Free University Amsterdam, and from SURF. Uh, the infrastructure uh, provider for educational uh, systems in the Netherlands, which is actually where I'm also uh, talking from today. And I also want to acknowledge the role of the metadata providers and more specifically of Statistics Netherlands and of uh, Center Data Research Institute based in Tilburg, um, which handles the LIST panel. I will uh, uh, explain in a second what that is. So I think the situation, the current landscape that we are in in the Netherlands is probably familiar to, to many of you. So we know that there are many collections in the social sciences, data collections that are available uh, for reuse, but they're often scattered across different repositories. So it can be very burdensome for a researcher to go to each single platform every time they want to search for data. Uh, for their own research question, and every time they have to get to know a new interface, uh, get sense, make sense of, of a different metadata schema, and maybe also the access conditions are often 
Even though they might be similar, they are worded differently. So this is all very burdensome. And it makes the process of data seeking and reusing uh, more difficult. Um, so the logos that you see in the picture are just from the Netherlands, but of course I'm, I'm sure that this is a situation that you uh, are familiar with. And also the other common problem, I assume, is that um, many of these data uh, sources are actually very sensitive, so uh, centralizing the, the whole data collections would also not be really possible. The data providers will not agree to just let go of, their, of the control um, over the, the data that they are responsible for. So two examples that I want to draw your attention to today are uh, CBS, Statistics Netherlands, and the LACE panel. These are two very different data sources, but they are both very important for Odyssey and for the Dutch social sciences. Uh, Statistics Netherlands is the national statistical office, so they, of course, produce lots of um, aggregate statistics on the country, and these are often based on uh, micro data, so individual level data. Uh, this data is very granular, it concerns all people residing in the country, and this data can be accessed under very strict conditions and only via a remote access environment. So this is a great opportunity for researchers who can conduct research at a very, very granular uh, analysis uh, level. Uh, but there are also some, some hiccups here and there. So before the portal was uh, alive, uh, the only way that this microdata was documented was via PDFs on the website, which is not ideal, of course, for searchability, especially because the way this data is structured is that you have data sets with maybe 17 million uh, individuals, everyone residing uh, here in the Netherlands, but only a few variables. So you usually for an average research project, you need up to seven or eight data sets. You need to merge them all together before you can get all the variables that you want to run your analysis. So there's a lot of data searching involved and PDFs are not exactly the best way to support that. And also the way this data is documented is not exactly clear. There is some flavor of SDMX, which is a metadata standard for uh, official statistics, but there are also some other um, fields that are not exactly clear and aligned with other known metadata standards. This is one case, and the other case is the LIS panel, which is handled by Center Data, the research institute I mentioned before. This is a longitudinal uh, online household survey panel uh, so a bit more traditional social survey in, in, the, in the social science context. They have their own archive and they have, they comply with, with the DI standards um, and also access is easier. In this case, it's, it's only for researchers after signing a, a statement, uh, but then they can download the data and free, uh, use them freely. Whereas for CBS microdata, then you really have to get into the remote access environment and nothing can be taken out of there. So I hope this clarifies the Dutch context a little bit. Um, but this is where we come from. We want to make sure that this data can be found and reused by the whole community. And if we don't find a solution, then everything is very siloed and scattered in different places. So this is where the Odyssey portal comes in. So what we are trying to build is basically a middle layer, a way to really federate the search of these different data collections. We have lots of different data providers, but as I mentioned before, we cannot just tell them, just give us your data and we'll make them available. So what we do, we only get the metadata from them. This of course involves some work for some of these providers to make sure that they can deliver the metadata in a machine readable format. But once they do, we can take this metadata, we ingest them, we harmonize them to a common schema, which is a sort of, uh, profile of, of DDI and mix of DDI and Dataverse. We harmonize this metadata, we make it searchable via one unique interface. So from one search bar, you can search from all the fields from all the different providers. So that already makes it easier for researchers who don't have to go to each single platform to get to the data. And what we are working on is also to enrich this metadata with uh, structured vocabularies to uh, enhance uh, the search functionality and uh, and actually support semantic search. So to make even the search uh, moment uh, really smoother and easier for researchers. And the third component of the portal is also data access broker because once you find the data, often you also want to access it. 
So we are building this middle layer that we negotiate access on behalf of the researcher, send the request to the metadata provider, and once the request is accepted, then the data can be transferred to the researcher. Depending on the type of data, that can be in the form of download or maybe by a connection to one of uh, one uh, theory. Uh, it's important to note that the data don't come to the portal, but the data stay with the provider. For us, this is very important, and that's how we ensure collaboration with the metadata providers. So I want to now dive a bit deeper into the three components. Um, and if you want to follow along, well, I have the slides, of course, but you, you can also uh, visit the portal and maybe follow along while I, I explain. And if you have any comment or if you have any feedback also in the coming days, um, we, I set up a, a board where you can share your thoughts also anonymously. I think it's, it's really great to be able to present our tool um, to such an expert community. So in terms of metadata interface, uh, the portal, Odyssey portal runs on Dataverse. We already include over 5,000 records from four main uh, metadata providers. All the records have a DOI, and for those of you who work with administrative data, that's, I, I think uh, you may recognize the challenge that assigning DOIs to administrative data, microdata, that's, uh, that has been a big step for us. Uh, for all uh, record, we also um, provide a recommended citation and we include variable level metadata, especially at the moment, actually, only for microdata, uh, for the metadata from uh, Statistics Netherlands. And that really helps the search. Um, in the future, we want to expand, include metadata from more providers. And we also want to include metadata from providers that don't make the metadata available elsewhere. So what we have right now is metadata from collections that are already on other platforms, uh, but we also want to use the portal to convince those providers who don't want to deposit their data in an archive, but at least to make their data uh, metadata searchable uh, via our portal. We are also working on uh, a plan to exchange the metadata with other platforms. Uh, we, for instance, with, with CESDA, the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives, but also with portals from other domains, in particular from the health sciences and the humanities. Um, for what concerns the search functionality, this is a bit more experimental. Uh, of course, via the current interface, we already support search across all the different providers and also the faceted filters help to navigate uh, the large amount of, of records that we have in the portal, but that's not enough. And especially in our context, we have the problem of multilinguality. Uh, all the metadata from Statistics Netherlands are in Dutch, and a big part of our community doesn't speak Dutch. Um, and even the metadata from the other providers are often in English, so that makes it a bit tricky. What we are doing then is to enrich the metadata that we have with control vocabularies. What we're doing right now is to enrich uh, the keywords that are assigned to, to the records uh, with the European language social science thesaurus, which is a thesaurus of concepts and it's multilingual. So what we do, we take the Dutch term and match it to its English translation. So that, and then fit this into the term so that if you look for waste, for instance, you can also find Afvalstoffen, which is the Dutch, uh, the Dutch uh, translation of the term. And we also want to expand, the, we, are, we are still uh, trying this out uh, but it seems to work for the keywords, and then hopefully we can expand to other fields and really make a uh, semantic search, uh, a more, yeah, a rich semantic search. And finally, the third component, as I mentioned before, is this data access broker. I have to say that this is not visible yet uh, in the portal, but of course, a lot of preparatory work is being, uh, has been going on in the background. Um, we are working on understanding and harmonizing the access conditions to these different uh, data sets and also to understand how the licenses are assigned and maybe also find a way to uh, standardize uh, licenses with restricted access data. Uh, but uh, in the future, uh, I mean, right now we are developing these access pipelines. And the idea is to integrate an identity management system in the portal uh, relying on the SURF research access management, which is uh, more familiar for the Dutch-based users, but 
uh, it also relies on international standards. So to some extent, it might also be possible to, to work with it um, even without an affiliation with the Dutch institution. Um, and once that's integrated, then it would be possible to already um, send some very basic information about the users to the provider. And that should already maybe uh, reduce the steps to access or to request access to the data. We also want to uh, connect the portal to a research data exchange, which would be a system to control data movement. As I mentioned before, we don't host data on the portal, only metadata. So uh, it's important for us that, uh, um, that, that, that the data exchange is also enabled somewhere. And finally, uh, we also uh, are working on the connection to uh, trusted research environments, which might be the solution for uh, convincing some more, you know, reluctant metadata providers and giving us, well, their metadata, but also to make uh, the, the access conditions to their data clear. And in this context, I just want to briefly uh, talk about SANE, uh, the secure analysis environment, this is a trusted research environment that we are building uh, at Odyssey together with other institutions. Uh, and the idea is to create this closed uh, analysis environment. A researcher can enter and analyze sensitive data, but nothing can leave the environment without the approval of the data provider. Um, so that could be, for instance, an output check where uh, the provider would check the um, results of the analysis to make sure that there is no uh, disclosive information in there before the, the researcher can export it. So of course, this, this is a bit of, it's not even a support component of the portal, it's maybe a bit of an announcement, but um, if we can offer this solution, we really think uh, it will increase the availability and accessibility of data uh, in the Dutch context. So with this, um, actually, I'm going to conclude my talk. I, I hope uh, you found this interesting and I hope you will visit our portal. If you have any feedback, I would be very, very eager to, to hear it. We, this is still a prototype. We still have 18 months to go before the end of the project and we have lots of uh, features that we want to implement. Um, we also have a GitHub uh, repo where we share all of our code, which might be interesting, especially for those of you who work with uh, Dataverse and maybe want to see some of our um, tweaks. Um, and finally, well, if you want to uh, stay updated with the developments, we have a newsletter, we have a Twitter account, uh, we have an email address, and so there are many ways to, to, to keep in touch with us, and we will actually have a release, a new release of, of, of the Odyssey portal in the coming two to three weeks and the multilingual search function will probably be included. So I invite you to check this out again, maybe in a month from now, and let me know um, what you think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you, Angelica. Any questions? Anybody from? Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering for metadata, does um, Odessi create metadata records or do you usually just get receive those from uh, the other, the sources, I guess, the source institutions? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Uh, no, we receive them from the partners or yeah, from the institutions. At Odyssey, as a consortium, we support many data collections, but we don't own any of them. So we don't produce metadata ourselves, um, but we only yeah, get them from the partners. I should say though, that we are working also on a way um, to help those metadata providers who might not have a system to you know, export their metadata in a machine readable format. We are also working on a way to, to help them with that. And that will probably go via the data archive, uh, the National Data Archive dance. Um, it probably uh, people will need to go via them to create the metadata records, and then they will also be harvested by the portal. Any other questions? Okay, I got a couple. <laughs> okay. 
uh, follow up on that. I, I think I'm understanding the relationship of Odyssey with Don's. So Don's is really the archive. They have the curators, et cetera. Or as you said, the metadata could be created by the data provider. And Odyssey provides a secure way of uh, making data accessible. So is the, is the data that you serve, you have over 5,000 data sets, are they all really restricted data? Is there any public data in your, your system? I was interested with this edu-gains and the, the way that non-Dutch uh, users can access your, uh, your data. Uh, is that even a possibility for people who are not from the Netherlands? Yes, thank you very much for your question. I think it really, really depends on the different, on the data sources. So um, among the providers that we have so, uh, until now, um, I would say uh, one of the sources is Dataverse NL. So basically it's, it's the Dataverse instances of the Dutch universities. So, and then it really depends. And there are, there's lots of open data there. Uh, and when it's not open, it, it depends a little bit on the conditions set by the university maybe or by the researcher themselves. When it comes to the least panel data, uh, they have a restriction in place for, like, you can only use the data for research purposes, but as far as I'm aware, there is no uh, res restriction on the country. So you can actually request access from any part of the world. And when it comes to um, CBS, so the Statistics Netherlands microdata, uh, then it's more complicated. Um, it's not only in the Netherlands, that you can use the data, but uh, it's also not everywhere in the world. So it depends, uh, like I think you can use it from the rest of the European Union and also from some other countries that have agreements, but for instance, at the moment, it's not possible to access it from the US. Uh, so I, I would say it really depends on the data provider and also the extent to which we will be able to actually automate the request workflow, that's also a bit dependent on the provider. And the users, once approved, it's all done in your systems. They, they can't download the data to their own systems. Um, well, not from the portal, because the data won't be in the portal. But in the case of the list panel, for instance, how it works right now, you can go to the list data archive, you sign the statement, you create an account, and then you can download the data on your own laptop. So that would be possible um, if we manage to automate part of this workflow via the portal, then ideally at the end, yes, you can download that data on your laptop. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, it's time for our final speaker for this session, this wonderful session we've been having. Um, this is Jessica Koh. Uh, Jessica is a senior data curator at the Roper Center for Public Opinion Research at Cornell University. She works with other members of the data team to develop and maintain the archive collection. She has been with the Roper Center for six years and holds a BS in Human Development from Cornell University and an MS in Library and Information Science from Syracuse University. Jessica will be discussing Archiving experiments, a time-sharing experiments for the social sciences called TESS. I think it's TESS, right? <laughs> TESS and Roper Center collaboration. Jessica. All right. Um, good morning. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction, Ron. Um, uh, yeah, so it's such a privilege uh, to be here and so great to see you all. Um, as mentioned, I'm from the Roper Center um, for Public Opinion Research. Um, so as you might know, uh, the Roper Center is independent and nonprofit. Um, it's the oldest archive of public opinion data in the world. Um, founded in 1947 with data dating back to 1935. Um, so here we have a glimpse of our archive uh, known as IPOL, and it has two main sections. Uh, one for survey data sets with over 37,000 published. Uh, that can be accessed through the Studies or Datasets tab pictured. And we also have uh, one section for individual survey questions with over 850,000 published um, that can be accessed through the Questions tab pictured. 
And of those questions, we currently have a collection of over 13,500 from experimental studies. Um, so these experimental questions are archived separately uh, from our traditional survey questions and can be identified by the purple marker pictured here. Um, so over 13,000 of these questions were derived from the past couple years, um, which we've spent cleaning and archiving data sets fielded from 2009 to 2019 for the time-sharing experiments for the social sciences project, um, otherwise known as TESS. Um, and pictured here is TESS's website, um, where each of the approved studies um, are listed out by the year they were fielded. So prior to partnering, um, this website was the sole distribution system for all of these studies. Um, and TESS is an NSF-funded initiative that offers researchers the opportunity to submit proposals uh, for experiments. And it's a wonderful resource for researchers, um, as TESS then fields successful proposals for free. Um, on a representative sample of adults in the United States using NORC's AmeriSpeak panel. Um, so given its importance and usefulness uh, to the social science community, our hope in partnering was um, therefore in part to promote and increase the visibility of this collection. Under this grant, uh, Tess and Roper collaborated to achieve three main goals. Um, preservation, findability, and usability. Um, with preservation, we naturally wanted to ensure maintenance of these studies so as to prolong their usable lifespan and prevent information loss. And prior to our grant, uh, the materials for these studies had only been stored in an open source framework. Um, and so while there are currently um, certainly advantages to this type of framework. It doesn't provide the kind of security and maintenance requisite for a max maximized lifespan. Um, so archiving with Roper served to create a long-term backup for these studies. So our next goal was to increase findability. Um, and prior to our grant, each of uh, the more than 200 studies could only be found on a single web page in a long list organized by year of publication. Um, so while it may not uh, currently be unwieldy for some familiar with TESS, um, as the project continues over the years and the list increases in length, it could certainly become so. And additionally, uh, once you navigated to a specific study, you would then be redirected to the external site to access the data. Um, so under the current grant, um, in entering each of these into our archival database um, with sophisticated uh, research functions and with data and met uh, materials all in one location. Um, our last goal was to increase usability. Um, when we started the project, uh, the data was presented just as the researchers submitted it. This meant that data would often be available in only one software format, um, and sometimes there would be missing documentation, uh, missing variables, um, uh, variable or value labels, or missing variables entirely. Um, some accessibility needs were also not met, such as providing alt text for images. Um, and I've emphasized this point um, in the slides because it's of its particular importance. Um, but what's really unique about this project is the question level data itself. Um, it means that frequencies, full question and response wording, and any additional context and associated materials um, are presented along with each individual question right on the website. So this significantly increases um, ease of use for those who either may not have access to or aren't familiar with how to use statistical software, um, for example. Um, but by the end of the project, we had addressed all of these items and more for 10 years worth of data. Um, this took about a year and a half uh, to complete. So our next challenge was how to make these goals happen. Um, we had to consider a few things, including how to give users an idea of what each study would be about, 
um, how to preserve the experimental structure of each study when entering questions into IPOL, and how to present associated materials for each question to ensure they would be independently understandable. So with the first point, um, what we had to consider was that um, we typically enter abstracts essentially as keywords or phrases summarizing each question in a survey so that users can search the archive to find questions addressing their subject of interest. Pictured here is an example of our typical abstract. Um, but this approach wasn't going to work for TESS. Um, a lot of them use unique experimental setups uh, to study a single question of interest. For example, um, one study sought to test gender bias uh, by presenting respondents with scenarios of fictional startup companies. And one was a craft beer company and one was a cupcake shop. Um, then they introduced uh, differences by treatment group, such as uh, gender of each startup's owner, whether the startup received an award, um, and so on. But most users' first instinct when searching for questions addressing gender bias um, probably isn't going to involve searching for questions about beer or cupcakes. So pictured here is an abstract we wrote for one of the test studies. And as you can see, we decided to diverge from our usual abstract approach of using keywords and phrases and instead, we went with one a bit closer to abstracts you might typically find um, associated with journal articles. So this involved um, often wading through five to 50 pages of study proposals and background information in order to write up summaries for each study um, of around like five sentences each. So with the second challenge, um, how to preserve experimental structure, we typically enter questions into IPOL based on the overall sample, um, which makes sense because when you're asking respondents about, for example, uh, the most important problem in the country, the average study is not testing for different effects. Um, but with the test experiments, it wouldn't make sense to present a question in IPOL as being asked of the overall sample. Uh, for example, uh, what was the name of the brewer, uh, David, John, Sarah, or Michelle? You'd want to have a question like this broken out by treatment groups so that they uh, provide meaningful information. So pictured here are a couple of the questions entered into IPOL from one of the test studies. Um, this was the uh, beer and cupcakes study. Um, and you can see we decided to um, do exactly that, um, that is enter questions into IPOL broken out by treatment group. Um, this means that you'll often see the same question entered under one study multiple times, but with a different subpopulation um, for each. So in order to break these questions out by treatment group, um, we would split the data set on, uh, using a provided treatment group variable, or um, when these were not available, um, we would create our own treatment group variables uh, based on the treatment group parameters um, uh, described in the study proposal uh, and then run frequencies. So when using this approach, um, a number of studies, about 40 or so, um, were archived at the data set level but had to be excluded from question level entry due to overly complex treatment group setups. And most often, um, these overly complex setups that we had to exclude involved conjoint analysis, um, so that if we split out according to their parameters, uh, would have produced hundreds of treatment groups each with minuscule samples per group, like often in the single digits. And so pictured here is just um, a visual, um, an example of the possible combinations for um, treatment groups for one of these studies. So when possible, we tried to enter such studies at the question level under broader treatment group categories, um, but often it was not possible. 
So we then trained DDD, um, an organization uh, we have based in Kenya that we've previously had just doing data entry for us um, to prepare these frequencies for entry into IPOL. And pictured here is an example of the work that goes into preparing questions for entry into IPOL. It's a very manual, uh, labor-intensive process. Um, since our primary concerns are to preserve full question wording um, and to ensure that questions are independently understandable by adding notes of context when necessary, um, subpopulation information, and other details. So this means that questions are not entered into IPOL via data extraction. Um, rather, it means that each question is manually curated and typed in by hand. Um, so after we reviewed these markups, uh, DDD would then start on their usual job of question entry into the IPOL database. And finally, uh, pictured here is an image uh, that was included in one of the, st the test studies, um, the same uh, beer and cupcakes uh, study. Um, uh, along with alt text describing it. And so many of the um, test studies did include images. So in order to present these and other associated materials along with each question um, to ensure that each is independently understandable, we had our IT team develop functionality for displaying images. So the IT team created zoom in functionality um, and we have all text that we wrote for um, and included for each image to ensure adherence to accessibility standards. Um, one issue that we also used the image feature to resolve was that a number of studies included large chunks of text uh, presented to each respondent um, as shown here. And these were unwieldy and would have been time consuming for our data entry staff to enter for each question. So we opted as sort of a compromise uh, to enter these chunks of text as images as well. For example, uh, this image includes three separate chunks of text. Uh, respondents were shown for one question, um, tiled together into one image. And alt text uh, for each of these uh, paragraphs was of course included and um, had full wording for each. And thank you. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about uh, this project uh, or the Roper Center, I've included some links. And please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Jessica. Any questions? You started to address the question I had written down, which was how did you do the question level data? And I had to say, is it automated? And you said, no, it was very manual. So could you talk a little bit more about how much time that takes and kind of what that represents in terms of the, getting a study up online? Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, so it is very time consuming. Um, so it generally takes, um, an experienced IPOL uh, prepper to um, about a day to mark up um, and prepare 100 questions. Um, and, and that's just for the uh, handwritten preparation part, um, writing out what needs to be entered uh, into the IPOL database. So once that part is done, uh, then we send it off to DDD, our organization in Kenya, um, that, um, you know, and they're on Kenya time, so we have like uh, things going day and night. Um, but then they do the data entry. Um, so, you know, that's a time consuming process in and of itself. Um, yeah, so I hope that kind of answers your question. It, um, and, and a lot of organizations uh, will get top lines for frequencies, but for something like uh, the test experiments, you have to run frequencies for them after you break out um, the sample into different treatment groups. And then, um, you know, so you have to wait for the data set to be cleaned and processed first. Um, so that add times as well. Any other questions?
Oh. Oh. Great. I take my prerogative. Um, this is really great. I was really excited to when I saw this come out a, a little while ago. Um, so I, I guess I have two questions that are sort of related. So one is, how did you decide which uh, experiments to include? You just did like a 10-year period. Are you intending to go back in time? Are you intending to keep going forward? Um, we're definitely planning to uh, continue moving forward. Uh, actually, right after this conference, we're going to start archiving the uh, next two years. So, um, and then hopefully we'll continue in the future too. That's our uh, tentative plan. Um, there is data um, on the test website that goes back uh, prior to 2009. They have back to 2003. Um, I'm not sure um, if we have plans to archive that. Um, I hope we get to it eventually. Um, right now we're just focusing on moving forward though. So my, my related question to that is, um, do you have any concerns about just sort of integrating these into the general Roper collection in terms of like, you know, compared to most surveys, they introduce a lot of complexity, right? I mean, you mentioned that just with the image of the conjoint analysis. And, you know, I go to these kinds of presentations from like political science researchers who are doing these kinds of experimental stuff, and like sometimes they have a hard time explaining to like an audience of like experts like what it is they tried to do and how to make sense of the results. So have you gotten any like feedback from end users and or had any thoughts about like, you know, if somebody just encounters and they're like, they search for a question in iPoll and they get something back, how to make sense of that in the context of like, you know, this may be a little bit more complicated to digest than just like this, you know, CBS poll of like the nation. Yeah, that was definitely a concern of ours. <laughs> so um, we kind of tried to address that in a couple ways. So um, first, I think the most important way that we tried to address that was by separating the uh, test questions and um, yeah, the uh, test experimental questions from the rest of IPOL. Um, so if you try and search for um, uh, like something on uh, LGBTQ plus um, that topic, um, none of the questions for the test studies would come up in your results if you were searching in our regular IPOL database. Um, if you um, searched for test experiments, though, like in the uh, keyword search, you would come up with all of the um, test studies, and then you could go um, to their individual questions using the experimental marker that we have. Um, so that's one way that we sort of hope to address that. Another way um, was our uh, writing out of summaries, trying to like briefly explain um, in the abstract section uh, what each study was just briefly about. So we hope that helps, and also, um, you know, we include, of course, extensive documentation about each study. Um, yeah, so we've, we've definitely, that's been a concern. <laughs> Any other questions? Great. Yeah, Alicia Holbrook-Moore from Minnesota. Thank you so much for this talk. This was super interesting. Um, I was exploring some of the links you shared. Um, and one thing I noticed is some of the newer test studies, they have their materials on the open science framework. And so I'm wondering, I noticed there aren't, at least the ones I've looked at, didn't have DOIs there. And there are DOIs for their Roper uh, counterparts. I'm wondering, are there plans to link the metadata somehow on those sites so that um, people who are finding the data perhaps through different ways kind of know all the different data that's available and how to cite it. Um, yeah, so that, um, there actually are DOIs on the Roper website um, for each study. Um, you'll find them uh, for whatever, in, in any collection we have, we have like a long-standing methods collection, uh, recently developed methods, then you know, there's our, our test studies are in the long-standing methods collection. Um, the questions, you know, at the question level, they're separated from regular IPOL. But if you go to the study info tab um, on each, any study that you look at, you'll see a DOI. Um, they don't have DOIs on the test website, though. I think uh, that will be it. I'd like to thank Jessica and all the uh, speakers today, uh, Diana, Zhengguang, 
and Angelica. And I encourage you to follow up with them, email them. The slides, the recordings will be available after the conference is over. And please, if you haven't, if this is your first uh, ISIS conference, go to the business lunch because you'll learn what ISIS is about and how it's sustained by the hard work of a lot of the people who put on things like the conference and keep the organization going. But let's give a final uh, round of applause for our speakers. <laughs>